Gumba Malgan, Gumba Nani Gian Indu, Uruguri State Library of Queensland Goo, which is good evening, it's good to see you, and welcome friends to the State Library of Queensland. My name is Vicky McDonald, and it's my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library, and to welcome you on behalf of my colleagues to the tonight's conversation. I'd like to begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. At State Library of Queensland, we are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to our facilitator for tonight's conversation, Eddie Sinnott, and also our panellists, Professor Henry Reynolds, Hannah Duncan and Charles Passy. Tonight, we continue our special talk series with The Conversation, the world's leading free, fact-based news source, written by academics and edited by journalists. 30 years ago, Eddie Koiki Mabo changed Australia forever. Though he passed away before the historic High Court decision was handed down, the impact of his ambition and commitment continues to inspire us all today. At State Library, we are very proud to continue the conversation about Eddie Marbo's life and accomplishments through Legacy Reflections on Marbo exhibition. The exhibition curated by Gail Marbo, Dr. Jonathan McBurney and Kelly Williams brings together 25 Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists in the spirit of reconciliation. Each artist has responded to an aspect of Marbo, celebrating a man who is both a rebel and a dreamer. After the discussion, I encourage you to visit the exhibition in the Philip Bacon Heritage Gallery, which is located on level four of this building. I also invite you to listen to our latest podcast, Hi, I'm Eddie. Hosted by Rihanna Patrick, the podcast explores the trailblazer's life, courage and vision with our new podcast series. Tonight, we welcome four guests whose lives and achievements are deeply entwined with Eddie Marbo's legacy. I look forward to hearing their insights about his life and the future of native title in Australia. This conversation is broadcast on the State Library of Queensland live stream page, and you will be able to watch the recorded conversation on our website, our Facebook page, and also our YouTube channel. Tonight, we'll be using Slido to collect questions from both online and the auditorium audiences. So if you go to slido.com and enter the event code, the co hash, the conversation, or you can simply scan the QR code that will come up on the screen throughout the event. And if you are sharing your thoughts on the event this evening on social media, we encourage you to use the hashtag SLQ, the conversation. But now I'm very pleased to introduce our facilitator for the evening, Eddie Sinnott. Eddie is a Womba Womba First Nations person and an Indigenous academic lawyer and researcher with the Griffith Law School and the Indigenous Law Centre at the University of New South Wales. Eddie writes about Indigenous experience at the intersection of law, culture and society. So welcome, Eddie. You're already on the stage. Um, enjoy the conversation. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. It's my great pleasure to be here, and um, might as well get stuck in. I did have a couple of announcements, but I think Vicky's covered them all, so that's fantastic. And uh, thank you, Vicky, for the invitation uh, for the State Library of Queensland and uh, the conversation as well, um, who have been a great friend to, to many academics and uh, to myself over the years as well, to be able to get some of uh, what some people may consider some of my boring research. Uh, out to the greater public and with the great help of uh, editors, uh, some of them that are here in the room tonight as well. Uh, I'd first just like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the country in which we meet today, the Yuggera and the Turrbal people, and extend that recognition and respect to uh, all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, present. If I could ask uh, Hannah Duncan to join me on stage as well, and Charles uh, Passy. So Hannah, come up. Sorry, it's gonna be very informal. Um, Hannah is the granddaughter of uh, Eddie and Benita Mabo. She's a lawyer with the Queensland Human Rights Council and Caxton Legal Centre. And Charles, being a son of Dave Passy, who was one of the claimants in the Mabo uh, case, a storied career himself in Indigenous Affairs, former chair of the Healing Foundation, 
uh, and here with us tonight. And then also Henry, um, who I'm sure most or nearly everyone in the room will know. Uh, so it's fantastic to see you here as well, Henry, tonight. Uh, Thank you. Renowned uh, historian, author, someone that's had a massive impact in this area, particularly with uh, Eddie Marbo's story and the story of the Marbo case too. And if you haven't picked it up yet, Henry's latest book, uh, Truth Telling, get this right, History, Sovereignty and the Uluru Statement. Mine's all tabbed up, all, all good points, Henry, no bad points. Uh, and so thank you, thank you for my panelists for joining. Thank you. I also made a couple of promises to some people I think are here, I just can't see because of the lights, uh, that I wouldn't talk too much about, my, about myself or my own <laughs> ideas about Barbo. Uh, so I think I'll throw straight into Charles. We were talking earlier about 30 years, it's a big time. I won't mention how old you said you were 30 <laughs> years ago, um, but can you start, I guess, by reflecting on what it means for you, the, the stories behind it, 30 years, it's a long time. 30 years. I was 28 then, now I'm 21. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I was here in Brisbane at, at that time. Now, I've seen Dad come down, because when, when he come, when they had a case here, or uh, court, what's the name, here in, here in Brisbane, he'd come and stay with me. But he never told me, he, he, he never told me what, what, what he was here for. Um, but as a son, I was there for him. So I, I had the privilege of sitting in one of the, the, um, the court um, sessions, um, sitting next to Dad, and Eddie Jr. was next to Uncle Creaky. Um, and I'm, I'm in the photos. Or the, you can see the photos of the team coming. So Eddie and I were walking behind them. So young Eddie and I. And when it come to the photo in the front, I don't know why, but Dad pushed me out. He didn't want me in the photo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think maybe because I was better looking. You know, <laughs> anyway. um, but when the, when the decision was handed down, um, um, myself and the late Uncle Steve Mann, who I, I got involved with in a Torres Corporation here in Brisbane, Uncle Steve turned around to me and explained. He sort of asked me, do you know what this is? I said, I've got no idea. Then he explained to me what Dad, Uncle Koiki, and the plaintiffs had actually done and what the decision was. Um, it was hard to believe. Like, you never thought something like that could happen, you know? So we went up to Townsville for the first Maryam meeting. And at that meeting, um, when you walked in the, in the door of the, of the council, council hall at that time the energy in the room was just it was like you were jumping into a pool it's just that you can feel the energy and little pockets of yes yes around the room it just like it, it's hard to explain and it's hard to believe it's just like incredible anyway um, we all sat down and the lawyers turned around and said and they con congratulated the Miriam on achieving something uh, unique in this country. Now the room erupted. But what the lawyers said was, all this case is done is unlock the door. There's plenty of work we need to do now. You know, plenty of work need, need to do. Because the case has thrown Terranalius out the door. <laughs> so we now need to, to work towards how we do something to capitalize on this. We need to act then. And by the time we um, ticked off every box or stood on every stepping stone across the room, by the time we reached the other side, we could have a treaty with this country. Now, the Miriam, though, turned around and um, was so happy and so proud in, in winning such a, a, a case that they thought the next step was to, now we can go for independence. So we went back to Mariana and they, they held a, a meeting up there. And in doing so, we lost momentum. We, we lost moment, momentum. I think there was a great opportunity there to 
um, to put a case on the table and say to this country, okay, now the terror analysis is gone, we now want to work with this country to see how, you know, how we can fix this, how we can come up with, a, with something that says, um, um, now we've come into the light because before we didn't exist. Now we do exist. How do we get onto this country? Um, and the lawyers were saying, with a treaty. Um, I think the Miriam, um, since that day, are still doing the same thing. 30 years on, all we're doing is staying on a platform and saying, look at me, look at me. We won. But we haven't. See, for me, like, that, dis that decision um, should have given a greater hope of freedom, cultural freedom, spiritual freedom, you know, um, social freedom to the people of Murray Island. But pre-Mabo, pre-Mabo, Malo's laws were all about respectful engagement. post Mabo, now we have the right to take to each other to court. So we don't have to worry about respectful engagement anymore. Now we have rights. Malo's laws is all about responsibility. But now we can, we don't have to worry about neighbours anymore. So if there's a boundary and we're having a dispute over the boundary, we're not forced into court. But our neighbour is actually our family. So under Miriam law going back time immemorial, we live on a small island community. We can't upset each other because we're living in each other's pockets. So the culture was very strong on respectful engagement. Now, when you look at Murray Island, um, there's no respect anymore. People have rights to blast their music until two, three days later, can drink their lives away. We talk about respecting our elders, but there's no real respect in the community. Um, We've lost sight of, of the power of the village, the power of the culture, the power of being recognised that now we exist. Now it's, 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 now it's become a legal thing. So where to from here? That's the thing. I think Maryland people need to take the initiative to come together and we'll sit around the table together and say, go back to the drawing board. How do we rebuild? How do we make the decision become something that is not only just for the Miriam, but it's taken this country to the, to the next level. How do we make reconciliation become a part of it that stops... Because the fear of Mabo, you know, it put a big um, fear like, oh, you know, um, people are going to come take our land and blah, 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 and things like that. But how do we, we bridge that gap? How do we look that towards a, a country that says... Um, we're all Australians, not just black fellas this side and white fellas this side. Hannah, put you on the spot. You're the next generation. <laughs> Jokes. Um, thanks, Charles. I think one thing and what we are talking about before and um, something that I always try to reiterate to my students or to anyone I'm talking about, Marbo, is uh, how important that recognition was when previously it wasn't there, at least formally, anyway. And that can't be underestimated and if anyone's familiar with uh, the recent cases of Love and Toms and, and what's been happening with the previous Australian government where they've tried to deport Indigenous peoples that aren't Australian citizens, uh, it was the, the Mabo case that played an important role in the High Court there saying that Indigenous peoples couldn't possibly belong anywhere else but here too. Um, and so it continues to have that impact, that rightful recognition that didn't exist before, um, but also as Charles addressed the, you know, the reality of what native title and of what Mabo has been for a lot of Indigenous peoples since. Um, Hannah, we are a little bit younger. Uh, what is, are you able to share with us as well what, you know, looking back, what the legacy of this has been for you as, as a lawyer, as a family member? Sure. Um, well, I wasn't around when the decision was handed down. I wasn't born yet. Um, but growing up 
knowing of my grandfather's accomplishments and like myself and all my um, relatives are very like we're proud of his accomplishments and it's really um, encouraged us to, to you know to see what we can pursue um, so you know uh, Arthur, like I call him Arthur um, that just means granddad so um, him and the other plaintiffs you know with low educations were still able to um, make such an impact on a nation and, and redirect the, um, the position of Australia. Um, so, you know, what more can... It's, it's exciting to see what more we can do from there, um, from what they could achieve, really. There's something um, really important that I, you know, think of more powerful than what you've just said then, too, and what Charles, you were saying, too, about when the decision happened and what should have happened or what could have happened and if Uncle Cor here had been there. But there was a point in um, the first Australians documentary where they're reading some of his letters and he talks about the need to get political, the need to, to do something, the need to embrace that opportunity that you're talking about, but also what he wanted to do at that time as well. And if I can bring Henry in here. Henry, you were there at the beginning as well. Um, are you able to share you know, your reflections on what it was like then, what that relationship was like? And, I guess, what spurred on that need to get political and to see this change happen? Yes, I've been thinking about this and thinking about many conversations that I had with Eddie um, 50 years ago or thereabouts. Now, I suddenly realised that for much of the time in the early years, that is, in the late 60s and into the 70s, um, Eddie was uh, not concerned about land and property rights because he didn't think that he had any reason to worry. He, he was certainly involved in Aboriginal land rights, but he didn't think that it applied to him. He was quite confident that he owned the family land. Now, what, what concerned him then was the, the power of the white people, the power of the Queensland government to dominate the lives of people on, in the Torres Strait. I mean, the, the department, the state government department could take people off their island, could keep them there, stop them coming to Australia, control their lives. And he said to me one day, one of the reasons I came to Australia was to try and learn uh, why white people had so much power in other words, he was interested in, in politics and what we would actually, you know, what we call was sovereignty, you know, government, power. And that was his principal concern. Now, that was replaced uh, after that famous meeting when Noel Luce and I realised that, I mean, he was very, very, a very proud islander, very proud of Murray and Darnley, and very proud of his own family land. Um, but when we explained to him that he didn't own the land at all, it was all Crown land, he was astonished. Now, if other white fellows had said that to him, he simply wouldn't have taken much notice of it. But he trusted us, he realised what we were saying was true, and that was the beginning of the Marbo case. I also did talk to him about the possibility of winning a court case because I knew there'd been court cases in the American Supreme Court and that uh, Murray Islanders would have a very good chance to win such a case. But in, in a way, uh, the concern for his own property had taken the place of that concern about government and power and you know, self-determination. And there's no doubt that that continued. I mean, the two things continued uh, to be of great interest. And ideally, he would have wanted to deal with them both in the same case. But his very, 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 very experienced and brilliant legal team said, no, look, if you try and get both, you, you'll fail. Uh, you've got a very good chance to overturn terra nullius in relation to property, but the chances of overturning terra nullius in relation to sovereignty is absolutely nil, as, you know, the, the court, Brennan and others, said at the time. So 
Terra Nullius was wiped out in terms of property rights, and that has had an extraordinary impact all around Australia. I mean, I was looking up the statistics this afternoon, and there have been for over 450 native title cases that have been dealt with, and there have been over a 1,000 land use agreements all over Australia. And 40% of the Australian land mass is now held under native title of one sort or another. Now, that is an astonishing change. I mean, the, the legal change itself was astonishing. After 204 years, Australian law about property was, 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 was dramatically changed. And that has led on to people all over Australia uh, claiming their land. So I don't think you can in any way underestimate the importance of that. And in a way also the global importance. Uh, you know, I've talked about Mabo all over the world and there's no doubt it's now a, a famous global case mm. in relation to Indigenous people's rights. But we still have the problem of treaty and sovereignty. And that, as I say, that, that still remains in much the same way. Because Terra Nullius, the British said two things. They said these people don't really own the land, they simply move across it. They're not, they're not fixed to the soil. They, you know, so they don't have property rights. They also said these people don't have settled societies, they don't have settled law, they don't, they don't exercise any sovereignty over Australia. So Eddie won the case that was most immediate to him at the time, his family's property, leaving the question of the government and self-determination unresolved, as it still is. Thanks, Henry. I'll just remind everyone as well that you can submit questions using Slido uh, as we go. So if you'd like, you can start submitting them uh, now. We can uh, address them as they come, and we'll also have a Q&A uh, towards the end as well. Uh, I think the, the point that you made about power um, is very important and powerful, a point about power, uh, to the story or, you know, the thickness of what makes native title what it is and what the Marbo case was. Um, a lot of people forget about Marbo number one, as it's known in the legal kind of circles, uh, and the importance of what the, the implications of what the Racial Discrimination Act. Um, another case called Kuwata and Bielke Peterson. So Bielke Peterson is someone that <laughs> lingers large over this uh, whole issue and, and the legacy of this case as well. And so for Eddie to, you know, to take it up, take take it up to those people, for you know, the state government at the time to implement legislation to remove, um, so that this piece of legislation, sorry, uh, the Queensland Islands Coastal Declaratory Act, basically trying to circumvent what the Marbury claim was and say that it had always, you know, been crown land once once they got control of it. So to have you know the entirety of the Queensland government of the state going against you, trying to force your hand, and and coming from that place as well, I think it's you know so important to highlight um, just how courageous uh, you know that that victory was and the challenge, but also um, the burden that's carried by Indigenous peoples, our families, and our communities in these situations as well. Um, you know, it's obviously not something that was just won uh, by Eddie Marbo himself or you know by your father Dave and and the others, but you know, the wives, the children, the communities, and that legacy belongs, um, you know, to that community and the people today. Charles, you mentioned a little bit about what we've kind of got as a result of Mabo or the, uh, the mess of native title or, um, you know, there are those great victories that, that Henry spoke of, but there's also those challenges that remain and there's also that second part of what Mabo, you know, kind of was about or what informed it about sovereignty and self-determination and that, you know, rightful relationship uh, between peoples. Are you able to reflect a little bit more on potentially the next 30 years of, of Marbo and, and where we go to from here, addressing some of those issues that you spoke about? I, I think it's very important that, that the Miriam do, do something drastic about whether going back to the drawing board, really looking at where to from here. Um, um, specifically for for what it's like back home in the community, you know, 
now we get a lot of our young people are, lo are losing. Like if 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 you if you haven't been born pre Mabo, then you haven't experienced that cultural that cultural responsibility and the cultural responses to land disputes, the cultural responsibility about keeping families, you know, tightly connected, you know, and going through the processes of making sure that we don't go beyond tonight's, tonight's um, mediation without bearing our pain and our disagreements and then waking up in the morning all happy and ready to be a family again, that the boundary has been, you know, we sorted that out. We're stuck in a place at the moment where we've still got so many disputes, 30 years on, still haven't been resolved because the processes, the, our processes are still not there. It's not in a place where... So we've got families living and we've got young people that can grow up in frustration in the Miriam spin-off of frustration. Um, like at a moment, I, uh, Murray Ellen's a, a, a sad place to be in at the moment. There's no respect for our elders. I was at one, one, one time there where, um, um, I mean, you, you can hear young people just, just screaming, you know? People coming together at, at even public meetings, they say, okay, how are we gonna stop this? But alcohol, drugs, and now youth suicide is becoming, you know, a, a big part of our community. So we truly, truly need to go back to the drawing board. We've got to find a way to say that instead of sitting out our on our hands and waiting for the legal system to fix up our issues or for the country or be dependent on, on our young people to, 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 to save us into the future, this is a time now where those of us that still have connection to, to, to country to be able to share what we've learned. You know, because a hard thing to, to explain, especially like for what the plaintiffs really looked at in trying to say, look, it's not about land ownership. It's not that I own, like dad now, talking about his evidence of Gyar Pit, which is the, the pointy beach on Dawar, on Dawar. Now, every time I go to Gyar Pit, when I sit on the beach and put my feet in the sand, you know, there's a different feeling from if I go down the Gold Coast and put my feet in the sand. Because it, it's, it's great to be down on the waterfront and you can smell the salt air, it reminds you of home. But I know when I put my feet into the sand, it's not my, I, I don't belong here. I'm, I'm just a visitor. So I go with sensitivity and I can sit there, make sure I don't leave rubbish behind. But the main thing is, I, is that I'll make sure I don't behave badly on somebody else's country. But on, on Gyar Pit, when I bury my feet in the sand, the sand, I can feel the, 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 the land, the spirit of the land come through me. You hear the, the wind in the, the, the grass and in the trees. It sounds different. It's like your ancestors are speaking to you. So how do you explain that? It's not ownership. It's not being owned. You are, you are part of that land. So for me, that's, that's how do the plaintiffs put that out there to, for this le legal recognition to recognise that? How do you prove that ownership? When, when it's, oh, it's unreal. <laughs> how do you explain it? Because that connection is not only to, to, the, to, the, to the beach, it's also because of um, Audawar, which is the big hill, um, and because I'm connected to Gyarpit. Now, my totem is the, the wada, the frigate bird that, that sits on the top of the hill. So we don't have high mountains out there, so we don't have eagles. Our highest fly, fly is the frigate bird. So that's my totem. And when we praise the frigate bird, we say, Iraka kebur. Iraka kebur means like it's a bird that wants for nothing. It's not like seagulls that fight each other on the beach over scraps. <laughs> and you can hear them squawking at each other and you can shoo them away. You don't see the frigate bird. The only way to see them is to look up. And they're just hanging like a kite and they're surveying the whole beach. So they, they're bigger picture people. 
So I put myself in that, that regard. I'm not a manager or a worker on the ground. I'm a visionary. So I like to see what's into the future. So how do we plan? How do we look at all the dangers? How do we look at what's in, into the future? On that point, Charles, um, you said it's, and it is, it's hard to express in an yeah. environment like this. There's a question, it's related to the Uluru Statement, but I think it's more broadly about what you're talking about. And it's about how can the spiritual sovereignty or, or our sovereignty, Torres Strait sovereignty, um, coexist with that of the Crown. Is that something, and Henry, feel free to jump Hannah <laughs> as well. But for me, you know, what you're talking about is how to give meaningful expression to, to the relationship between those two as well. For me personally, like this is where I now have Hannah. I can, Hannah can take the, the, the legal side to the next level. But I need to make sure that on the ground, the Miriam have to start living and thinking sovereign. We've got to be, start acting like we're sovereign. Because how can we sit at a table and sign a, the, on, the, on, on, the, on any kind of treaty if we don't act like we're sovereign? Otherwise, we'll be acting like victims and all we're doing is holding this country to account. So there's a big part uh, of this big job that we're not looking at, and that is to build our people. You know, for example, I heard it in um, one of the leaders say too, if we're looking at constitutional reform and if it comes through a referendum, there's a lot of work about getting the sheep into door, this door of referendum. So for us to do that, we've got to start building relationships because we need the country to vote for us in the referendum. But if we still live in, a, in this, live in a culture of holding the white fella to account and living in a, in a culture of us and them, then it's going to be very hard to win any referendum. So there's a lot of work needs to be done. And that's where I think, um, especially people of, of my age group now, we've got to start pulling our families together and start um, empowering people with the cultural knowledge and the cultural power. Then when they do end up rising to, the, to, to, to sit at whatever table, we sit at that table culturally empowered instead of just um, educationally empowered, if I can put it that way. Henry, you've uh, written towards the end of your most recent book about uh, the words that come from the Uluru Statement about the ancient sovereignty shining through and that it is more than just a, you know, a symbolic representation, the, the, the deepness and the seriousness of that sovereignty. Um, from your perspective and you know, your history of long research and advocacy in, in this space, how do you understand that question? How, how can the spiritual sovereignty mentioned in the Uluru Statement coexist with the Crown? Yes, well, there's a, there's a profound problem um, that is the, I mean, at the centre of the Uluru Statement, in, in many ways, the, the most um, moving, uh, poetic passage, indeed, was about the continuation of First Nations sovereignty, that it has been there, it still exists, and it can coexist with the sovereignty of the Crown. Now, that is undoubtedly, uh, as I say, the, the, the single most important part of it. But Australian law won't have a bit of it. I mean, Australian law, and this has been true of numerous cases, the Australian legal system says, no, there is only one sovereign, and that is the Crown. And you can't have any other sovereignty in Australia. Now, that's not the situation, and never has been in North America, but that is still legal doctrine and uh, enunciated in the High Court on numerous occasions, and at, at the same time by Brenham in his lead Marbo judgment. So there is a, a profound um, disagreement there, and I think that needs to be resolved. Now, what people don't realise is that Murray did not become part of Australia or did not become of, of the British colony in 1788, like the rest of Eastern Australia. It only became uh, annexed by the Queensland government in 1878. 
Now, I think that that claim should be challenged. Uh, just as the, um, the, the Marbo case in relate, Marbo number two in relation to land was the ideal place to argue the case. And that's what, what Caston and Key and Cohen realized. And that's why they took the case. I think the, the question of the legitimacy of the Queensland government claim of sovereignty uh, should be challenged. And uh, I think that's why there should be another case like the Marbo case, not about property, but about sovereignty. And that is what the Miriam can do. But that's, of course, another matter altogether. But there has to be a resolution of the question of sovereignty. And, you know, if the courts go on saying, no, 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 don't be ridiculous, there is no other sovereignty. Well, the place to the place, the place to put the crowbar under the whole system is to challenge the Queensland claim in 1878, because everyone knew. I mean, at least in 1788, you could say the British just didn't know, didn't understand what was in Australia, but they knew that the Murray Islands were heavily populated. They knew that people lived in villages. They knew that people, uh, you know, had gardens. They knew they grew crops. After all, the missionaries had been there uh, from 1871. So the excuse that this was a terra nullius when Queensland grabbed it uh, simply doesn't stack up. And it doesn't stack up uh, according to the judgments of the International Court on similar cases. So I think, uh, you know, I mean, there are many, many other things to do, but in terms of the relationship with the Australian government and the Queensland government, I think that is a case that should be fought. Thank you. I, um, I myself, as some of you may be aware, are intimately involved in the Uluru Statement process and have lots of opinions on that question. And I'll keep them to myself for now just because I don't want to talk for the rest of the time that we have here. Uh, there's another question there that I'll address quickly within that though. Um, Someone's asked about teaching the Marbo case and has anything changed in how you teach it or attitudes changed over the last decade? And I just want to quickly say um, the youth quite literally is where our future is and that uh, dismay at, you know, the, the disbelief that this can still be the situation, um, wanting to find an answer, um, you know, I'd say almost all of my law students come through um, experiencing that and wanting that. And um, the, the sooner more of them can vote, and hopefully before we have a referendum, uh, the better. Because I think, um, you know, although we've got a long way to go, there has been some very positive and, and, you know, and good changes that have come through, and people understand the fundamental injustice of that position. And uh, Hannah, going out on a limb, I'm going to include myself as part of the youth still. No. Um, and I'm sure you have Me too. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you've been asked this a lot or, or you've been told a lot, you know, um, you're the youth, you're the future, it's on you, or not that it's on you, but it's for you, um, you know, take up the education, take it forward. Um, how do you feel about or see the next 30 years of Marbo? Do you still see hope in that legacy moving forward? Yeah, I, def I absolutely see there's, I think there's a lot that we can, we can do. Um, and there's a lot to come, essentially. Um, like some of that being what's, like, so we've got, so went the Marbo decision, then we can jump a few steps. Apology, statement of the heart, and then what's coming next, potentially, of the um, proposed referendum. Um, that's exciting. Um, and then to address what um, Uncle Charles and Professor Reynolds spoke about is if, if the Torres Strait Islands decide to challenge the Queensland case, and correct me if this is not what you intended to mean, but if that if they challenge Queensland, and then you couldn't really annex yourself from Australia because it's they've claimed sovereignty, um, but if that made them an independent state to get more resources up there, and then that could impact on um, what Uncle Charles here was saying is. Um, then the the issues that are faced in rural communities, um, and you know, with you know, alcoholism or um, you know, youth suicides, 
you can't just expect local people to address deep, um, deep issues without any support and being so, like, where, where the basic rights of um, accessible food and waste removal are not being met. Um, so there is, there's a whole complex layers of, of mm. what more can be done, and not only just in the Torres Straits, but all across Australia in rural communities, um, there is limited resources that are being built where people who are on CDP, which is community, like, work for the dole for rural areas, um, are, like, are crying out for a number of years to have real jobs. Um, and then those opportunities to develop and develop their own communities and run a business or um, and teach that um, autonomy and um, build their self-cultural pride and all of that is being undercut. Like, there is, there's so much you can do um, in just... And, yeah, there's, just, there's a lot you can do. And it's like there's a whole lot of layers to, to getting there um, that will need cooperation from federal, state and territory um, governments. So I think it, like, you could say that it, oh, yeah, we're going to have a, tr uh, a referendum. That's if we get enough votes. Um, and then if we don't get enough votes, then it's kind of sh cut short for another 30 years until it's a topic again. Um, so that's a little bit scary, but that's kind of, yeah, there's, there's just a lot more that can happen um, for a lot of people. And, um, and then Uncle Charles mentioned that uh, there's a lot of conflict within communities, and this was brought about by um, having to have strict Western approach for what is traditionally um, a dispute resolution process that they had amongst themselves culturally. So it's like undercutting their cultural autonomy, essentially. So even if you don't get sovereignty to start, like if sovereignty is the end of what people are seek seeking, autonomy and how they govern themselves um, grow um, and build cultural pride and how they manage their land, that doesn't, is, that's not inconsistent with sovereignty, I would argue. And I think when we you know, talk about the legacy of Margo, Marbo, sorry, uh, just in the, the topics that we're talking, you know, Henry spoke about the strategic decision to focus on, on the land rights as, as winning a court case. Um, but we can see just in the issues that we're discussing and how important it is, that the symbolism of, of just how important the Marbo legacy is, um, how much, perhaps unfairly sometimes, in, in, the, you know, in the lack of other recognition, um, that is attached to that legacy uh, for Indigenous peoples. You know, we went through um, the failed promises of the social justice package from the Keating government that was supposed to be in response to Mabo, um, the Howard years of, of practical <laughs> reconciliation, um, and most recently the Abbott um, instigation of the Indigenous Advancement Strategy. So all of these kind of things where government decisions and policies have been vitally important for what you're talking about, about resources, about empowerment, about the recognition of you know, the rightful place and the ability to practice culture and to maintain that. Uh, and something that has always been a kind of jarring issue with Marbo and Native Title about how you communicate between the two systems, uh, where the court and, and, and the government processes have you know, kind of forced very harshly to fit under this hierarchical model, uh, where the reality is that there have been multiple sovereignties here in this land for, for generations, for eons, that have practiced sovereignty you know, aside, whether it's families in the Torres Strait, whether it's different groups of peoples on the mainland of Australia. Uh, that's been part of who we are as Indigenous peoples, having shared sovereignty and shared spaces uh, and being able to, you know, potentially move towards that in the future. There's another uh, really good question that I saw come up, which I think is really important to, to acknowledge as well, and it's why I wanted to acknowledge uh, the families and the communities and um, Aunty Benita Marbo. And, and the women as part of this process as well. Um, and the question is from Simon, what is the role of First Nations women in leadership in this process? And what is the role of men in being supporters of that leadership? And I would be remiss not to give a shout out to Professor Megan Davis and Aunty Pat Anderson, who are two of my, uh, well, both of my bosses at the moment as well. <laughs> uh, but two of my mentors and people that I've been able to learn a lot from and see them leading from the front as Indigenous women. As a young Indigenous woman, working in this space, leading in this space. Um, do you see things changing for the better or...? Uh, yes, I'd see it changing for the better. Uh, I think it's still a balancing game. Um, for example, 
um, where if it's to do with cultural customs, it's still a paternalistic system. Or paternalistic? Yeah. Anyway, it's a, still a man-dominated system, um, and I wouldn't overstep my bounds, but I'd just use the knowledge I have because... Um, and just kind of do, like... I just need to frame this correctly. Um, I think there could, there's still value that can be added, um, and it doesn't have to be in direct, directly speaking out, only when it's particular to, um, like, culture. Um, but outside in the Western system where things are quite equal, then I am not afraid to stand up for um, my people and what... Um, indigenous people are looking for. I think there are, you know, there are important differences, and one of the the downsides of native title to Charles that we're talking about is the impact that it has had. Um, you know, not the promise and the legacy of Mabo, but what the government basically and vested interests have done with the native title system. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of those legacies has been that relationships with one another, and it's also had a gendered element to it as well. Um, how would you answer that question about the role of, you know, female leadership here and the way that men can support that? I think for me personally, like I was saying earlier, is that the communities become a place where it's hard to live there now. Um, it's, it's like we lost our soul as Miriam because, you know, now we're a legal mess, if I can put it that way, in, in, in that regard, in our, in our head. Now, what that says to me is that um, um, around the table of, of fighting each other, that's seen as a man's role of, 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 of attacking each other. You know, the, the sad thing for me is if we put our women in the same boat in terms of fighting each other, and, and it, it's like Mare has lost its soul there. So how do we bring back our soul? And it's that nurturing spirit now. Um, because that's what, that's what kept Marie Allen alive for hundreds and hundreds of years in a small island community, so respectful that if someone cries for help on one beach, the other beach would hear it, there's a cultural response of, of immediate you know, response to it. Now, there's a lot of it in, 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 in how we, for example, there's, there's a term that's it's interpreted as gossip, mudmir. It's interpreted as, interpreted as gossip, but we see it as a nasty gossip. But mudmir, to me, is house talk. That house talk is how families sit around the house now and plan about how do we support each other where there's parts are lacking, how do we support a young couple, you know, that is about to be married? How do we support um, a family that has become broken? How do we do this and how do we do that? Now we've lost that. Now we've lost that. We live in a culture of dependency. So Marie Allen sits on wait for our social issues to be looked after and women's issues and all that thing, to be looked after by an organisation that sits on Thursday Island which is a long way away. So there's a culture in Murray Island now of just, ah, oh, don't worry about it, we can't, we can't do anything about it, so we live with it. So we live with, with our frustrations, we live with the fact that we can't get our, our um, disputes resolved, we can't do this, we can't do that. So then it becomes a culture of sitting on our hands. So that, this is where courageous and innovative leadership comes in. And how do we sit down without saying that we're going into traditional roles of men and women, but how do we get the best out of the team? That we build a family that, that, that um, there are those that as warriors, they're there to be expendable. There are those that, um, that, that we need to keep because they keep the family together. So how do, we, how do we come up with a plan in that way? And once we've got that plan that looks at the, at, at the village and the empowerment of the village, then that plan has the roles equally set aside 
for, for men and women. But if we look first at just the rights of men and women, and the, then the village deteriorates. And I think that's what we're stuck in at the moment. There was another question. I think it is lost in the others, but it, it was a good one. Uh, Henry, for you, I'll, I'll throw it. Um, I think I know the answer, and it's racism. Uh, but it was what, what motivated or what pushed the Bjelke-Peterson government to, to do what they did in response to the Mabo claim with the Decalutri Act and, and what they were getting out there. I guess especially from you know, your experience at the time of being there. Well, what people don't appreciate is that the idea that, um, that Mabo might win was, was extraordinary. I mean, almost no Australian legal people had had any training about native title. The only people who knew anything about it were often um, scholars who had worked in Canada and done their postgraduate work in Canada, which is a quite different situation. So that uh, I know this from uh, the fact that, that Margaret, my partner, was in Parliament from 1983 right up to 1996. And she was in the middle of the discussions in the parliament, in the government and in the Labor Party. And she would often say to them uh, when they were discussing this issue, because remember the Hawke government had promised that it was going to introduce land rights legislation and then was battered you know, battered to pieces by the mining industry and the Western Australian government, and they gave up. And Hawke said there's just no, no interest or sympathy for this issue anymore. And so she would say to people, well, what about this Marbo case? And no one knew anything about it. And they'd say to her, no, don't be silly. There's no such thing as native title in Australia. And so, yes, uh, I mean, clearly, uh, Belky Peterson in particular, it was racism in, in, you know, in obvious ways, but it was also highly paternalistic. Mm. Uh, and they just didn't think that uh, it was appropriate or possible that this, this could change. And hence their attempt to stop the process in its tracks when they simply said, if there is any native title, it's hereby extinguished. <laughs> An extraordinary bit of legislation. But you've got to think yourself back into that time when almost no one thought that you could win a case in, in the Australian courts. And that's why the Marbo judgment and the Wick judgment following caused such deep, deep concern and anger in the Australian community partly because they were so unexpected. Racism. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you know, a, a very important point there that I think Henry's addressed as well about the differences here and that we don't have... Uh, you know, when we're looking at the future too and the legacy of what Marbo opened up for us and the conversations we're able to have about some of those differences between us and some of the international examples. And this kind of leads into a question here that I'll address to Charles and Hannah. It's about the uh, Queensland government pathways to treaty process. Um, I, I always try and shy away from this, although sometimes I can't help myself, uh, mainly because I'm not a, not a Murray, I'm not from Queensland, I'm a Wamba Wamba man from New South Wales, Victoria. Uh, we've been going through our own treaty process down there. Uh, but I think it's something important for traditional owners themselves, two types of Islander people, to be able to address. So, um, should, should the Queensland path to treaty process be two processes? One to address Aboriginal people and one to address Torres Strait Islander peoples? Or is there that difference there? I, one of the things I remember Eddie Mabo saying was about he was doing what he was doing for all, all people, for all Aboriginal people. But when it comes down to the specifics of who's being represented and who gets to enter into a treaty. Um, I think that we should also respect that there are like a lot of different nations of Aboriginal people in Queensland as well as Torres Strait and they, uh, although similar, they don't necessarily overlap. Mm. Um, 
and any treaty that's going forward. If, it, if it's about recognising Indigenous people, then it should recognise their diversity, however that looks. I'm not too sure of what Queensland's um, processes are. I know they're being discussed, but I haven't looked into it personally. But I think that they should recognise the differences. Otherwise, you're going to have the same problem that Native Title does in just um, bulldozing over Indigenous people's rights again. Charles? I think for me personally, like, um, um, what, what's killing Torres Strait at the moment is our division, you know? So how do, we, how do we pull it back together again? I did my apprenticeship in Aboriginal Affairs here in Brisbane, Brisbane in the early 80s. And that time I got to learn about becoming part of the Brisbane black community. That was such a ride and, and, and a lesson for me. I, I grew up with Torres Strait Islanders, so I don't know much about the Aboriginal people. But I came to Brisbane as, you know, I was only probably one Torres Strait Islander amongst so many Aboriginal people. I got to learn, I got to experience the struggle, I got to understand um, part of the land rights marches, I got to, you know, part of the Torres Strait movement with Uncle Steve. It was such a pride time for me. And back then we didn't have a Torres Strait flag. We came under the Aboriginal flag. So I grew, grew up in my tender years of, of understanding then, in the, through my apprenticeship, was that I was part of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait people. We, we, we stood together as a people. I know we look at our recognition to, to stand separately as Torres Strait Islanders, but I'd, I'd like to see us, because that's the thing now, is how, how we become, we can still walk together as one people, but I know that I'm, I'm, if I live as a sovereign person, then I can walk as a Torres Strait Islander amongst a group of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, amongst a multicultural Australia. And I think we've got to get heavy on how we, how we break down this culture of our, us and them if we keep living like that, then reconcili reconciliation could never happen. And it'd be a struggle to get um, that treaty done in yeah. a way that says that, that we, we, we share this country together. I think that's, that's, that's very important. So I think that needs to be our focus in how we, how we, we live for one another. Um, and that way, I know Aboriginal Affairs stands behind that, that, that term. Always was, uh, uh, always will be Aboriginal land. Every time we say that, we exclude everybody else. And in excluding everybody else, then we keep the culture of us and them alive. So how do we move past that and how we get the country to a point where we can be there for one another? The last thing we want is for white Australia to walk on eggshells all the time and to be culturally appropriate. <laughs> See, that's, that, we've, got, we've got to change that. It's, it's, it's got to be different. Because for me, the, 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 the true essence of welcome to country, when you're welcomed to country, for, to have visitors protect this country, you give them a piece of ownership. So you do that by welcoming them in, into a family. You now become part of this family because we're the owners. So when you become part of this family, then we can walk on the land and every, everybody in the community knows you are part of the family. And when you're a part of the family, you come under the family law. So then when you're on country, if you break something, as a visitor, you'd probably go, oops, sorry, <laughs> and go and don't come back. But if you're an owner, as soon as you break something, oh, I'll fix it before I go. So how do we get that essence now that, that, that that essence in all of us as all Australians, that we can walk in this country together as one people and say when it comes to a referendum or if it comes to a, a, a treaty, we sign it as one people instead of to, you know, forever in a day feeling that we have to be culturally appropriate. So on that point, we're coming to an end 
And there's the top voted question, which works very well with this. And it's Charles spoke of culturally empowered First Nations community and moving together with the coexisting sovereignty. And the question is, what role do the rest of us have to achieve this? So I might go to each of you to, to finish off. Charles, just riffing off what you were going there. What role do the rest of us have to achieve this? Like I was saying, I'm, I'm forever about the village. And for me, the village, we all have a role in that village. You know, so how do we get everybody to come and say, this is our village together? So it's about standing together. If it's just about uh, this suburb, you know, us here in West End, we don't like the, like the, the north of the river, you know, <laughs> north of the river, the troublemakers or whatever, and things like that. You know, um, oh, those are Gold Coast, they're even worse, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so forth, you know. Um, until we can come to a place that says, okay, South East Queensland, for example, could I just quickly tell you, tell you, this is my dream. I wanted it to happen this year with the Brisbane Torres Strait Islander community, but I, I found it very hard to pull the Torres Strait community together. So I'm hopefully wanting it to, to do it on the 40th anniversary, which apparently is Brisbane's Olympic year. So if we can stage an event here that Torres Strait leads the way, that opens the door and sets a precedence for the other um, multicultural South East Queensland, but we lead it because that's it's our cultural way. And that's a, a process of, we call it Sibwanai Omar, which is a ceremony of forgiveness. We as Torres Strait Islanders have been living on this country for many decades. We haven't been welcomed spiritually and in the shadows of Mabo, we need to get that proper recognition. So we wanna say that um, We've been living here for decades, and in that time, not only our children grow up here um, and we prosper on this land, um, we also, at the end of the day, bury our dead, you know, without that cultural recognition. Now, spiritually, that's wrong. So we, we need to ask forgiveness. So I was looking at a ceremony that we do that, and if we do that, um, then the other multicultural, like one Samoan fellow said to me, he said, can we do that? And I said, yes. If you do that in the Samoan community, then all the other Polynesian communities come together. Then it opens the door for the other nations. Then hopefully at the end of the day, white Australia and South East Queensland can say, can we do it? And say, yes, you can. Now imagine if we do that together, that's how we heal this country. Not by signing some paper somewhere, for me, it's action, it's walking on the ground, and that's the process of true reconciliation. Henry, your book addresses many of these points in the context of what, for many, have been intractable issues between different peoples. Uh, do you have any advice looking to the next 30 years of Mabo on what role do the rest of us have to achieve this? Well, it's, it's I mean, I, I mean, the most immediate question is indeed, um, it looks as though there will be, uh, sooner rather than later, a re referendum about the voice of Parliament. And it is absolutely critical that that's won. Now, there were people, and still are, who say, well, yes, that would be most desirable, but what if it's lost? Because most referendums in Australia get lost. You've got to have a majority of states and a majority of people and if one of the, uh, you know, if, if one, if significant political groups campaign against it, there's a chance it'll be lost and that'll be a disaster. So I think, yes, we have to proceed. I don't think we can avoid that test and we've got to throw ourselves into it to persuade enough people to pass that, uh, leg to pass that referendum. And that is the most immediate and pressing question. And if that is one, then many other things become possible. Hannah, what can the rest of us do? Um, well, I've kind of surmised it down to one thing. Well, I know, two things, um, and then I'll break it down. So essentially, yeah, I think it comes down to Firstly, is respect. Um, so that means what Uncle Charles was saying is that um, we want to bring Indigenous people and uh, non-Indigenous people together. However, I think that 
can be done without having to assimilate the cultures and respecting each's independence and then tying it back to native title because a lot of indigenous people will see that as you know a core of their spirituality and their identity is the respect and their autonomy over that um, and then as well in education um, and becoming you know making sure you educate yourself and those around you of um, uh, of like against your against your ingrained bias not your like specifically but people have just a general bias um, and there's just a lack of understanding and education too um, about indigenous culture and it's not like there's lots of resources out there as well so it's it's in both both fields um, and then the the second part of it so that comes under the respect part that I think that would that would bring um, reconciliation and what everyone can do and then to in support of what Professor Reynolds said is that um, essentially it can be homework is um, making, you know, when the referendum does come, because we need a 75% um, vote in all of Australia. And if you consider it that the um, LGBTIQ vote only got 51% when that was passed, and that was quite normalised by the time that came. Um, and then Indigenous people are 3% of the population, then that's that leaves a lot of um, high risk if, of not getting a 75% vote. You could look at the 65 um, vote, but the political climate might have been slightly different, so I don't think that's a reliable source. Um, so yeah, it's about um, educating and spreading the word that the potential voice to parliament is not gonna harm uh, and it'll depend what they put forward as well, um, you know. But it's, I think I see a lot of, after the Marbo decision, there was a lot of fear around what it would look like and how it impacts um, the structures of Australia. And then, um, yeah, and that's, that fear can start spreading already about how it's gonna impact people. So, um, you know, educate yourself in, in your vote and tell your friends. And surprise, I'll say something about the Uluru Statement <laughs> to end as well. And the thing I would say is um, don't be afraid. As Hannah said, it has been a long time, um, well, since the 67 referendum, which was our most successful referendum. Uh, but the last time we had a referendum was the Republic referendum, the 90s. Uh, the landscape has changed, digital media, social media. Uh, the demographics of the nation have changed. We're a much more multicultural Australia. Uh, which you know has embraced the Uluru Statement from the heart. Um, as I said, a bit biased and part of a team that's had the Uluru Statement translated into over 60 languages. Uh, we were recently at the Federation of Ethnic Community Councils Australia uh, where the Uluru Statement was embraced. Uh, and I have it on good authority, which is my opinion, my authority, that the referendum will be successful. Um, <laughs> vote yes, share the word, uh, get it out there. Um, Everything is trending in the right direction. People are looking for something tangible, uh, for a real change to be able to deal with everything that we've spoken about tonight. Um, I'm a firm believer as an Indigenous person, but also as a constitutional scholar, as a lawyer, uh, in the reforms of the Uluru Statement from the heart, in the support that it does have uh, from all walks of life in Australia, not just Indigenous people, it's not just people in the street, um, you know, all the way up to some of those big baddies and corporates and, and every, everywhere else. Um, people understand that it is time for, for real change. And I think, you know, what, what can anyone else do? And I would finish on a line from the Uluru Sound from the Heart, uh, that it's an invitation and it's to walk together um, as Australian people in a movement for a better future for all Australians. And that's what the invitation of the Uluru Statement is and we welcome you to do that. So in wrapping up, I'd like to thank Hannah, Charles and Henry. It's been a great privilege to uh, meet you all tonight and to have this discussion. Um, I only emailed the group today about what I wanted to talk about or what questions I would ask. 
Uh, but my key point was I wanted to talk about the stories behind uh, Mabo and Native Title. Um, that's something I try to communicate to my students. It's what I wanted to come out uh, tonight. And hopefully you've had a chance to be able to hear that. Uh, thank you to the State Library of Queensland, to the conversation, uh, to our wonderful Auslan interpreters, who I'm sorry I forgot to introduce at the start, who have been working jukes up there at the moment. Um, <coughs> thank you to you, our audience, and everyone online, and your questions. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of your questions. Uh, I've been asked to also ask you to complete a survey via email or via the QR code. Uh, and uh, you can exit via either door. That's it. <laughs> Thank you.